the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The pledge to the Texas flag, it's in your program if you don't know it. Hold it up. Hold it, hold it. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas one state, under God, one and indivisible. Okay, if you'll bow with me. Our most dear and gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you today with hearts of thanksgiving for the great crowd, cloud of witnesses that have come before us. We are here to honor our history left to us by our forefathers. Help us remember that it is right and proper to honor and acknowledge your part in our history. We thank you for your mercy and your grace, and we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I uh, appreciate every one of y'all come out here today for this ceremony. It's important to our community. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, it's, a, it's great that we have these markers here that uh, remind us of our past and our history of our community, as well as the roots of our community. And I appreciate every one of y'all coming today to, uh, make, uh, to take note of this uh, for the, our community. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I want to give everybody a sincere and heartfelt welcome for being here on this absolutely perfect autumn East Texas afternoon. You support Trinity, you support Trinity's history, and you support Trinity's people and the work of the Trinity Historical Society. This day is especially nice for us because, because of COVID, we didn't have the fair this year. I think this is the first year the fair has been missed Bill uh, Elliott and I were trying to calculate since 19, the late 1940s. So this is the first year we haven't had our, our fair booth and the Trinity Fair. I know some of you have driven a long way. San Antonio, Galveston, the Woodlands, Lufkin, uh, and maybe some people from Waco will be over at the next dedication. Anyone else here that I haven't told of your city? Love lady. Love lady, and I think Conroe. we have people, Conroe. Conroe, and I think we have people all the way from Huntsville and Groveton, so, yes. I want to give a special thanks, a lot of you know her, Suzanne Waller. Suzanne Waller is a curator of the Trinity County Museum, and she's chairperson of the Trinity County Historical Society, and she manages the museum office. She couldn't be here today. Suzanne is not a Texan but she adopted Texas as her home. Each time I am fortunate enough to work with Suzanne, I sit there and I just marvel at how lucky Trinity County was to have her. So now I'm going to tell you about some extents, a few outstanding guests we have here and then we'll have our speaker. The first one I want to tell you about is Morris Gould. Is Morris here? Well, he should be. I wish, I wish you could meet Morris. Morris? is the director of the Galveston Railroad Museum. He had a large part in having our engine restored and placed outside the museum. And he also arranged in the Galveston Museum to have a whole hallway. They gave us a hallway at the entrance where a lot of our uh, artifacts and documents are on display and also some some audios of people's voices who were connected with the WBTNS or their family was connected with the WBTNS. We feel like the Galveston Railroad Museum is where our wobbly bobbly engine has its permanent home. And it is the showpiece of the museum because it's on the outside. It's the first thing you see as you walk up the side of the museum to the, to the entrance. I was just there two weeks ago with some friends and, I, and uh, and it's still there and it looks as beautiful as ever. It's on a raised platform, so it's quite visible. On tracks that they took from Trinity and placed it on those tracks. You'll see pictures of it in our exhibit. The Galveston Railroad Museum has one of the largest collections of engines in the Southwest, and it's one of the five largest railroad museums in the country. Santa Fe Union Station, which is a magnificent building. It's on the National Register of Historic Places. If you haven't been, go. That's awesome. Just go. 
It's uh, take your parents, your grandparents, your children, your in-laws, your everybody, your friends, take them. You will not be sorry. It is absolutely, you'll see how wonderful it is. And also, you can see the Moody Museum, and there's so many gorgeous things to see in Galveston. But I want to thank Morris Gould and his staff, because Morris arranged for us. These historical markers are quite expensive, and we have the biggest one for WBTNS. This marker was $1,800. The Trinity Historical Society does not have that kind of money. The Railroad Museum gave $800 towards this, and so we're, we're very appreciative of that. I wish I could, oh, well, I have thanked him in person, but I, I, I will again. Uh, Morris is now retired, but lives in Galveston. But Morris is, a re is another reason, we, we were gonna have another speaker today. His name is Jason Hayes. Jason Hayes just emailed me. He can't be here today. He gave, Jason Hayes owns the EZ parking down where the cruise ships dock. And Morris just approached him one day in the parking lot and said, Jason, we need, a, we need money for this historic society in Trinity, Texas, so that, because they can't afford the market, but we really need it for the market and the trains at the Galveston station. Can you give us some money? So Jason Hayes, not having met any of us, gave us a thousand dollars so that covered the whole those two people covered the cost of the marker Jason Rose is super special he's here today he's right there I'll tell you about him in a minute and also see the man in the black hat that's Everett Everett Luke very distinguished person listen to this and he has some interesting things to tell you but he is a consulting geologist who has lived in the woodland since 2001 but he's resided in Texas and Louisiana since 1970. He's interested in Texas and Louisiana logging companies and their railroads. He has served as president of the Southern Forest Heritage Museum in Longwood, Louisiana. And he is currently the museum's historian and director of their railroad operations there. And he's the superintendent and general manager of their in-house railroad, the Red River and Gulf Railroad. Everett's current project is mapping the logging railroads and tram roads of East Texas using state-of-the-art LIDAR imagery. Thank you so much, Everett, for being here. Another person I want to mention, a dear, dear friend, you all know her probably, Donna. We know her as Donna Micklewaite. She's Donna Coffin. She's Clara and Dana's and Sarah's sister. She is a member of the Texas, of the Walker County Historical Commission, but she grew up in Trinity right over there. Uh, she is a, one of our guardian angels. The marker was Donna's idea, so we have to give her full credit for that. She, she got us started. She supplied a lot of the information and the sources and the people she found Jason to us, and she's just a super sleuth. Uh, she was my go-to person with all questions and help and she helped us with our displays in the church. She's a member of Trinity County Historical Commission and Walker County Historical Commission. She's, she's gonna speak in a minute and you'll see why when she calls. The other Walker County Commission members who are here are Patricia Katz. Patricia, Patricia, where are you? There she is, she's holding my purse. <laughs> she, uh, she's an adjunct professor of communications at Sam Houston. She is also Walker County Historical Commission. The third most, my, one of my dear friends is Sandy Rogers. Sandy, where are you? Sandy, okay. She has two very prestigious titles. Sandy is an archeological steward for the Texas Historical Commission. <clears throat> that is a big deal. There are very few of them. Sandy is one of the few people, archeologists in Texas who is involved on the San Jacinto Battleground. And she has many, many archaeological digs in the works, of, uh, uh, especially the rough hospital that just completed that. And Sandy is Region 5 Director of the Texas Archaeological Society. So, if you get a chance today, please say thank you to these people. I think they all have on name tags. Now let's give them a round of applause. Yeah, Jason Rose. is. Uh, our first speaker today, he helped me write the marker text application. When you write a marker text application, the state requires at least five double-spaced 
essay with footnotes it's it's a pain it's a pain and and, and you get so much information you, you don't know where to you don't know where to begin you don't know where to end so Jason helped me so much with that he also found a video of the WBTNS chugging through Trinity two of them in in the night in the 1960s so uh, he has that on his website he and and Everett came to our fair booth a couple of years ago and guess what they did they know more about the WPD, WBTS and the track circuit through this county and two other counties than we did. So he, they took us on a tour of our town and told us where those tracks were. Um, also, he's going to do, he's videoing everything and he's also going to do interviews of anybody who wants to speak to him about the WBTNS after this. We're going to go to the chamber, he'll go to the Chamber of Commerce office down there, it's just two blocks. Let me tell you about Jason. He was born and raised in Houston near the Burlington Northern and Rock Island Railroads. So I think this gave him his first love of railroads. He has a lifelong love of railroad history. He lives in Spring now, 40 years from the Union Pacific Railroad. He's a professional network engineer in the IT industry. He married his high school sweetheart. They had, he is the father of one and has one on the way. He volunteers at the Red River and Gulf Railroad in Longleaf, Louisiana. He said that, that engine, or that train line, and the, and the Wobbly Bobbly have a lot in common, but they have much more of theirs left. That We just have our engine left. So please join me in welcoming Jason Rose. He is our first speaker. Thank you. Never been introduced before. It's a bit weird. Um, and I've got notes because I don't do public speaking, so. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Jason Rose, and by some quirk of the universe, I have come to be the curator for the virtual online museum for the Waco, Beaumont, Trinity and Sabine Railway, known as the Wobbly. My interest in this railroad began when I stumbled upon a reference to it many years ago and, uh, and realized I had crossed the grade in Blanchard, Texas, on the way to my grandparents' house on Lake Livingston hundreds of times and never saw it. In the fifth grade, at a summer camp near, near Trinity, um, we rode horses along the old railroad grade and passed an old trestle. And I knew at the time that it was, it was a railroad trestle, but being so young, I didn't think to ask any questions. So when I stumbled across this reference, it, it got me going, got me thinking, and uh, kind of started me on that path uh, to find more information. I soon realized there wasn't a whole lot of information out there. Uh, there was a few websites, very few, and a few books that referenced it. So it gave me a starting point to begin putting information together. And what little bit I did put together, I put on a page on my railroad blog website. So hidden amongst my travel blogs was one page devoted to the wobbly and the little bit of information that I found. That web page led me to meet several people. Um, Four of them stand out, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Murray Hammond of the Texas Transportation Archive, Everett Luke, who's a fellow rail fan and a gifted creator of railroad maps, uh, Susan Madeley, and Donna Coffin, whose uh, phone call a few years ago spurred the creation of a full website devoted to the Wobbly. Um, Donna and Susan grew up here, and they're in contact with many people that remember the Wobbly and who have family connections to it. Their, their network has provided many documents, uh, newspaper clippings, and most importantly, first-hand accounts for the website. Uh, I'm forever in their debt for opening up this treasure trove of information. All this activity in recent years led to this event today. Uh, Don and Susan expressed interest in getting the state of Texas to create the plaque, and uh, they immediately have my full support. Um, it's been 61 years since the, since the final wobbly train ran to Kittrell, a few miles west of here, to drop off empties and bring back tank car loads of crude oil. That train would have passed right by this spot, and the last operating locomotive, number one, failed a surprise Interstate Commerce Commission inspection, and the railroad was shut down. At the time of the last run, I don't believe anyone knew that the last train was the last train. So no fanfare, no crowd, no speeches. Welcome the crew after that last run. Uh, maybe today we can bring a little bit of closure that was denied in 1959. Uh, what began as a couple of short line logging railroads fell into bankruptcy and was cobbled together to create the Wobbly in 1913. The Waco, Beaumont, Trinity, and Sabine Railway is a grandiose title indicative of large dreams that would go unrealized. Of the four cities named in the railroad's title, only its city of origin, Trinity, was ever reached. 
Because of the tough economic times of the 1920s and 30s, rural obscurity, and a surplus of existing parallel railroads, the Wobbly fell far short of its stated goals. With its weed-covered tracks, Ford Model A motor car, sagging wooden cars, and decrepit steam locomotives, the Wobbly was the quintessential East Texas short line in, uh, sorry, you lost me when that started, uh, was a quintessential East Texas short line railroad in that era. Money was always in short supply, and the railroaders simply did whatever they needed to do to keep the trains running when there was enough passengers and freight to warrant running a train at all. Near the end, money was so tight that maintenance to the track was only done when it was absolutely, um, absolutely necessary, and that usually followed a derailment. This situation led to several colorful variations of the WBTNS acronym, the most famous being the Wobbly Bobbly Turnover and Stop, which is the source of the nickname that I use. There are others, and these paint quite a picture of what uh, the railroad meant to different types of people. The wine, beer, tequila, and snuff, the whiskey, beer, tobacco, and snuff, the washboard, tub, and soap, and won't be back till Saturday. That these nicknames have survived for more than half a century after the loss of the railroad is testament to its enduring legacy amongst the locals that finally remember it. But that population is aging and leaving us, and it is my desire to preserve what they remember and share that knowledge with a larger world of historians and real fans. This plaque goes a long way towards that goal. With this bit of recognition by the state of Texas, perhaps we can reach that wider audience and keep the memory of the Wobbly alive for generations to come. If you haven't already seen the website, take a look. Um, the video we're recording today, along with uh, other personal interviews, will be on there. There are also lots of photos, newspaper accounts, uh, articles, uh, first-hand stories, and the only two known videos that exist of the Wobbly in operation. <laughs> All right, so it's a, it's a pretty neat website. I recommend taking a look. It is, it is changing as I find more information uh, to share. Uh, and that, the, web, the website link is wbtsrailway.net. Any search engine, search for the Wobbly and you'll find it. Thank you for being here today. Um, thank you for allowing me to pr participate in this event. And thank you for remembering this neat old railroad. And a very special thank you to Donna and Susan for making this all happen. Thank you. Thank you for asking me to be here today. Uh, I feel like my grandfather, T.L. Everson, is, is, is here with me. Uh, I do want you to know that that wasn't just a job for him. That was his life, his passion, and his love. In our family, there were three rankings. Number three ranking were the grandchildren. Number two was his wife, Pearl. And number one was the wobbly bobbly turnover and stop railroad. I want to read you just a short thing from, taken from an uh, article in the Houston Chronicle, December 5th, 1948. Several years ago, William Burns was taking testimony as a court reporter in a compensation case in Brooklyn, Texas. He was at that time the official court reporter under Judge Max M. Rogers witness was a farmer who lived in Grofton at the turn of the century. The attorney for the plaintiff asked, and where did the accident occur? The witness answered, at the wobbly bobbly turnover and stop tracks, right where they crossed the highway. Mr. Burns, who had already been struggling with the Grofton backwoodsman's colloquialisms, dropped his pen across his pad and rose from his seat. The what? The witness repeated, wobbly bobbly turn over and stop. Despite his mental prowess, Mr. Burns still looked perturbed. The witness continued, that's the WBTNS, Waco, Beaumont, Trinity, and Sabine Railroad. Mr. Burns said, well, sat down, picked up his pen, his pen back up, and looked kind of limp. When this was written in 1948, the Wobbly uh, Bobbly, and I know, knew it as the Wobbly Bobbly, I don't know where the Wobbly Bobbly but I knew it as the Wobbly Bobbly, only had an eight mile, uh, eight mile run every other day that went to the Pitcher Wall Fields. And I don't know if it was common knowledge, but the train always, it backed up the whole way 
the eight mile way. And then when it returned with its load of mineral oil, it wasn't crude oil, it was mineral oil, then it came forward, where it then transferred it uh, <clears throat> to the Missouri Pacific line, where it could be taken up east for processing. Mr. Uh, T.L. Epperson, Thaxton Lewis Epperson, that's what the T.L. stood for, took over the receivership in 1945. I believe that it was in the late 30s that the train actually went into bankruptcy and Mr. Paul Sanderson uh, was the receiver during that time. Mr. Sanderson uh, was rightly revered by my grandfather. In fact, the reason he moved to Trinity was to uh, work for him at the Texas Longleaf Lumber Company. So when Mr. Sanderson died in 1944, Max Rogers, Judge Max Rogers, asked my grandfather to take over the receivership. And he said he would on one condition, that he be allowed to work with the merchants and the people in Trinity and try to get the railroad operational again. At that time, it was totally in the red. The trackage and the bridges were terrible and it averaged breaking down on the eight mile run at least four times. Now, <clears throat> after several years, this was in 48, uh, my grandfather was very proud of the fact that instead of four times a month, it had only broken down once in the previous five months. So, he, um, my grandfather was born in Polk County. His grandfather immigrated to uh, Texas when it was a republic in 1830, 1837. He grew up in Polk County, well-known family there. Uh, when he married my grandmother in uh, 1911, they first worked at the uh, lumber company in uh, the sawmill in New Wilton. My grandfather graduated from the Port Arthur Business College in Port Arthur, which it no longer exists, but at that time was really a good education. So he always worked in the office. And another thing, and I know there's nobody here <clears throat> that is old enough to remember it, but if you ever saw him, he was dressed like this. You remember, he had on dress slacks, he had on a white long sleeve shirt, and he had a tie. If he was in town, he had his suit coat on, and he had his gray fedora hat. He never dressed any other way. In fact, I was looking through pictures. I came across one of him handing out Christmas presents. He had on a suit, like most men, jeans, or, you know, khakis, or something that they use for relaxed wear. He never did. He, that was just... That was a hallmark for him. When he, uh, when the Wobbly Bobbly completed its final run in, uh, I believe, June of 1959, he spent the rest of his life, till he died in 1972, liquidating the assets. He was uh, meticulously, he was unbelievably meticulous. Uh, he wanted to make sure that every employee had been paid. Many of them had worked uh, at times with no pay just to get the keep the railroad running. He wanted to make sure that they were all paid, that all the bills were satisfied, and I believe most of that was taken care of by the time he died in 1972. Thank you for doing this. Uh, I don't know of any that would have made my grandfather happier or more proud than to know that his beloved WBTNS is being removed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Sometimes I wonder kind of why I'm here. Uh, I just kind of helped Jason with his website. Uh, my thing is mapping. Texas railroads and stuff, but while I'm here, I'm going to tell you a little bitty story about how I first heard of the Wobbly. Jason told you how he heard of it. Um, 
There's a railroad in Colorado that was very similar to the Wapak. It had very similar to the Railroad Railroad called the Rye Grand Southern. It was in receivership forever. Uh, they never made it from one end of the line without two or three derailments, et cetera, et cetera. Oop, don't go that way. Uh, I'll, I'm good here. And so um, I was at the Colorado Railroad Museum and I was visiting with a gentleman by the name of Robert Richardson. And he's passed on. And we were talking about the Rye Grand Southern and I had come up from Texas. I was living in Houston at the time. Bob says to me, he says, uh, Everett, they got something just like the Rye Grand Southern in Texas. It's called the Waco, Beaumont, Trinity, and Sabine. And he proceeded to relate to me his 1945 and 46 trips. He made two trips over the Wobbly. And at that time, they were still running as far as Livingston. And they would get right to the Southern Pacific crossing in Livingston. And the crossing had been taken out. So the car would stop there. And everybody would walk into town. And then they would back the car up and to a place where they could turn it around and switch things out and then little old Model A would come back here to Livingston. That was their daily train over to Livingston. And he told me that story. And uh, years later, Jason was able to get a copy and it is on his website and it's definitely worth watching of Bob Richardson's two trips over the Wobbly because he went out to the oil field as well. It's just worth seeing the wobbly in all its glory in the late 1940s on this video that Bob did. Um, it was mentioned that I do some things with maps. Um, maps are my thing. I'm a geologist. That's what we do. I mean, it's just what it is. So I brought today a little sampling for you, and we're going to have a full one done when I get it done. I was hoping to get it done today, but I didn't. But I'm using what they call LIDAR. And LIDAR is a laser projection down flown. It's the equivalent of radar, except it's done with, LIDAR, with, with laser. And the LIDAR will image on the ground right now, the image stuff I'm using, anything that's two feet, basically a two foot block. It's just amazing what it'll do. And I've been studying, I've worked through the, the Wobbly, I've got a map of the Wobbly that's active to within five feet now. And I've got all the little spur lines that ran off of it and the logging lines and everything else. This is just a little piece. But when it's all done, we're going to have it on Jason's website. And it's going to be interactive. And you all can find just anything you want. But look at all those black lines. I mean, there's Trinity. There's Groveton, right up there. I mean, lumber railroads everywhere that nobody even knew existed. This is the first chance we've ever had to do this kind of research, and it's going to be on Jason's website. So thank you for having me come today. Uh, my beloved Donna Cox, Donna Cox, Donna Cox, Donna Cox, Donna Cox, Bobbledy bobbledy or something. Not from us. We say wobbly bobbly. Uh, my house in the days that I lived here was right on the other side of the dollar store. <coughs> a little house. Between the house was a field where all the pulpwood trucks came in and loaded the pulpwood to go on the train. Then came in later years my mother and dad sold a house and built right down on that corner. So all this time through my life, I would, we all of us were right up in the face of the wobbly bobbly. <coughs> okay, I was going to say something about, let's see what it is here. Oh, I wanted to tell a story. I, I figured somebody else might tell this. But as the Wally came in from the east and would cross by the basket factory and then cross the tracks to the Missouri Pacific, then coming through where Derek Lane and Dr. Thornton's house were, then they'd come on down by the school and there's this big curve. Well, 
Sometimes she'd make it around that curve. Sometimes she wouldn't. When she didn't, it was, um, I, want, I want you all, somebody, if I'm saying this wrong, correct me. It, I mean, what would happen is uh, we would have uh, a signal from the wobbly. It'd be two longs. Boo, boo, the boo. Everybody in town knew what it was. They knew he was in trouble. They knew he was on that curb. She, I guess I think it was she. And everybody would stop exactly what they're doing at that time, get together, and they were down there. And I never knew how they got that train back on the track. Did they all pick it up <laughs> or what? If anybody knows, tell me. I'd like to know. I wish that Morris Gould was here today. I thought he was going to be here because I wanted to tell a little background on this. Uh, I think Susan, I don't know if you were involved in it, but someone was involved in do, going to the Moody Foundation to get some help on the marker, you know, pay for the marker. And they came back, the Moody came back and said, well, we're, we like to handle larger projects. So I went back to Mars, who was then director of the Galveston Railroad Museum. And I told him, and I said, well, they, they want larger projects. We don't have one. Get the marker that we want help with. And he said, well, Donna, just, i tell you what, give me a little bit of time and I'll call you back. And he did. He called when he called me back. He had $1,800 for the marker. And he had also, Jason, um, Ro 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 <laughs> no, Hayes. Jason Hayes in Galveston owns the easy cruise parking around, the, I don't know if it's all through Galveston or around that area of the museum. But Jason and Morris went together and paid the marker. I wanted to make sure we knew that. Um, let's see. Mary Moody, I want to thank Morris Gould. I want to thank Morris Gould. I want to thank Jason, that also contributed, but I want to thank Mary Moody, who rescued the, the, the wobbly wobbly. I think we've got a picture, Susan said, of the day it left Trinity. <coughs> when T.L. Epperson did everything he could at the very end, then it stopped. <laughs> it's so heartbreaking, but it rusted sat in the years. I, of course, I graduated 59 and was going to college and not paying attention. But the day that Mary Moody bought that engine and it left here, it was just heartbreaking. It was so rusted and there's a picture of it when it left that day. But anyway, I'm so happy about Trinity as a whole. Markers, markers. There y'all are building it. Markers. I'm Markers chairman. I was telling Susan, you know, I'm Markers over in Walker County, and I just feel like that's for guests, for visitors, for people. Our markers are so so important. Anyway, thank you so much. I'm going to be short. I'm Judy Bishop. I'm Judy Coffin Bishop. I oh, I'm sorry. I didn't give you. And I grew up here in Coffin for 25 years. And uh, I'm to talk about the WDTNS Foundation Incorporated. When the equipment from the railroad was sold, like Mary was telling about a few minutes ago, Mr. Everson did. I do remember Mr. Everson, I'd say. Okay. I'm going to take it. Is that too loud? No. Okay. The death people back here. Okay. The funds from the, that sale were put in a trust. And in 1999, the uh, WBTMS Foundation Incorporated was formed to try to do something, uh, make a good use of the income from that trust. The members of that board of trustees now are Judge Doug Page, John Reynolds, S.E. Denman, John uh, Thompson, and me. And the income from the trust is divided in this way. 
Twenty percent of it goes back and is reinvested so that the trust can grow. Eighty percent of it is used for scholarships for the four school districts in the county and for grants to nonprofit organizations. Uh, each, each spring, every year, there's an annual meeting where the board decides uh, which nonprofits will get grants and how much they'll get. And of course, the scholarships money is divided equally among the four schools. Um, we look over the financial statement. Somebody get out a calculator and take 80% of it and we divide it up in that way. It's really a very satisfying experience to make sure that you help kids get an education and that you're granting money to these nonprofits so that they can help people that need it. Are there, are there any other people who want to speak? Okay. You may not know it. I don't know if we've said it today. I don't think we have. The reason the marker is on that corner, you can see it. It's, uh, we're getting ready to go over there and unveil it in just a second. You see those wooden stakes under there, or those metal stakes? WBTNS, those are railroad ties from the WBTNS, so that's a special place for it. We want to thank the city of Trinity so much. Please look at their acknowledgments on the back of your program of all the, the men who put, who put that in Wednesday. It was put in Wednesday. Where the family dollar store is now, that is where the corporate headquarters were for WBTNS, so that's why we're here. But I wanted to tell you something else about a WBTNS that's very sweet. It, it was a commercial line. It carried pulp wood and mineral oil and oil from Pittsfield Field and so forth. But it also carried people. And who, pe people who didn't have a horse, they didn't have a buggy, they didn't have a car. They rode the WBTNS. They just rigged up different cars. They could put their vegetables on it, bring their vegetables in town. People who had uh, uh, gardens sold their gardens in town. So it was an all-purpose, multi semi-multi county transportation that was high tech back then that's all some people had to go anywhere and they rigged up a car you'll see it in the pictures they put uh, put uh, railroad wheels on a car and i guess people rode in it also and they delivered people's mail so it was quite a boon to people who did who had no other way to go anywhere or to get their goods transported or just visit their neighbors so it was it was a wonderful innovation for this time uh, uh, the way that on Alaska got their mail is with the Model A forward on railroad wheels, a 30 model Ford Victoria on wheels pulling a trailer that would haul 16 passengers and they would go take the mail Monday, Wednesday and Friday on Alaska. And when I was a kid I used to save up my 15 cents with my friends and we'd get on that in that trailer and ride to on Alaska and back. And also I rode in in the big train up to the oil fields up close to Weldon. Cause there's a couple of guys that I ran around with. They were twins and they were Lucas twins, Roy and Troy. And their daddy worked on the on the on the railroad. And so we were able to get on the train and go up to there. We were able to we had to pay to go to Alaska. But that's uh, some of the things. Another thing I might mention, the city limits was, a lot of people probably know that, the city limits is down at the Legion Hall and, and, and north up at, the, up at the top of the hill from the uh, hospital. And on the other side is where the uh, 356 highway turned off the road from the highway and went the middle of that road was city limits that way. Well, you couldn't get out, if you're downtown Trinity, you couldn't get to the city limits anywhere without crossing the railroad track. Because the city limits was passed here, and the railroad track was out here. And on the other side, it was, of course, uh, the 356, and uh, on, on each end is down by where, they tell me about where the Dairy Queen was, and up where the bend in the road where you angled off and go to to, to the sawmill, the mill town. And uh, so you couldn't get to the city limits, get, out, get to the city limits in any direction you went without crossing the railroad track. Two of them was wobbly tracks. Three of them were. But anyway, 
That's, uh, I know a lot more, but I'm not going to take up any more of your time. On September 28, 1881, the Trinity and Sabine Railway Company was chartered as a logging tram, connecting with the International and Great Northern IGNS Railroad. The line was intended to run east to the Sabine River, but only extended as far as Cone Mill. In 1882, the Trinity and Sabine became part of the Missouri, Kansas, and Texas Railway Company of Texas. In 1905, lumber magnate William Carlisle chartered the Beaumont and Great Northern Railroad to connect with the INGN. It was planned to run southeast to Beaumont, but only reached Livingston, 33 miles east of Trinity. In 1911, this line was sold to the MKT. In 1913, MKT merged the two railroads into a single system. The Waco, Beaumont, Trinity, and Sabine Railway Company on April 8, 1924, founded by Colonel R.C. Duck, purchased the line with Trinity as its hub and corporate offices. WBTNS operated 115.2 miles of standard gauge ballast free track through East Texas Piney Woods in Trinity, Polk, Tyler, and Houston counties. During its high point, WBTNS daily transported passengers, freight, and mail. Also, timber, pulp wood, tomatoes, vehicles, and later oil from nearby Kittrell Oil Field were brought to market. Loggers along the route christened the WBTNS wobbly bobbly turnover and stop for its frequent derailments due to quickly laid tracks. WBTNS Railroad was abandoned in 1961. Offices in the depot in Trinity were torn down in 1968-69. Engine 1 was an oil-burning prairie-type locomotive built in 1920 by Baldwin Locomotive Works. The Augustine philanthropist Mary Moody Northern funded restoration of the engine for display at the Galveston Railroad Museum. The WBTNS was a major transportation link in the area and was one of Texas' most interesting yet obscure railroads.